out-of-pocket deal, the seller actually is covering the costs. They walk the price down through price reductions in increments of five or 10K. Dude, think about the amount of people that will listen to this inside of our community and go, oh my gosh, Adam just brought a whole different structure to the table I've never heard of before. And it, you will give other people permission to go out and do similar deals just like this, where it's like, this property doesn't cash flow. Why not have the seller? All right, I got Adam with me today. Adam, what are we doing today, man? Are we going through a deal that you recently did or what? We are. We're going through an interesting deal that we recently did. Amazing. Tell me all about it. So we uh, came upon a situation where, um, you know, it was an inbound PPC lead from our direct-to-seller marketing channels, and the seller was uh, really struggling to sell their house. Um, you know, the house was... The so same. I'm going to interrupt you because yeah. there is somebody that's going to not know what PPC is, believe it or not. It's funny, like when you're barely getting into the business, you don't know what any of these terms are, but then when you're like heavy in the business, you forget what it felt like to not know what they meant. Yeah. So PPC means you guys are spending money on Google AdWords or are you guys spending money on Facebook Marketplace? Where are you guys Google. spending the money to get a customer to see your ad to Google. then call you? Google. Okay, got it. So you're spending money on Google. What are you guys spending on a monthly basis usually? So we, we actually aren't doing it anymore. Um, we were spending about six grand a month between the admin fee and the, the advertising fee. Um, and, uh, we found that there was a, a market decline in, um, the quality of the leads that we were getting. And historically we've been, um, very heavy into direct mail and that's worked for us for the last four or five, six years. So, uh, we've kind of gone backwards, um, well, not gone backwards, but we've gone back to, to direct mail, but at the time we were doing PPC. I love it. So this is good for people to know is that you, the longer you're in this business, the more you have to kind of tinker and figure out what works for you and your specific market because real estate is regional here in Arizona, direct mail is not a, a great strategy because it's so expensive. Sure. What, what market are you primarily marketing to and why do you think direct mail works so well in that market? That's a great question. Um, it's Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the greater Pittsburgh area. And uh, the average age of the population here is uh, higher than the median age, I suppose, in the country. So, you know, we are frequently, when we are marketing whatever channel we choose, we are frequently, it's not uncommon that um, a seller of ours doesn't have a cell phone, doesn't have a computer. We have to go to their house and physically sign contracts. Doesn't happen all the time, but it's not uncommon. So um, direct mail for that reason, you know, a lot of the people that we, we market to, they, they definitely go out to their mailbox and get their mail. So, On your PPC campaigns, what amount of deals do you think you guys got monthly for that $6,000? At least one, sometimes two? Yeah, two. We were doing two, sometimes three, and um, we were really heavy into the PPC. PPC was our only marketing channel when we're, we were in a different rate environment, and I think that had a lot to do with it because I don't. I know that the quality of the PPC uh, leads de deteriorated, in my opinion, but we were also in like a an easy money world where there was tons of hedge fund buyers paying ninety five percent of ARV. So all that together made it kind of easy. Um, but you know, at that time, we were doing about two to three deals a month. Okay, so what you're saying is your PPC leads, um, you know, when rates were lower and hedge funds were buying at 95 cents on the dollar, even though the leads were probably the same quality as they are today, it's just that you have less of an ability to sell them. So it's like you're looking at these deals back in the hedge fund days and you're like, man, I can, I can sell that. Even though the seller wants a little bit more money, I can still wholesale this thing to a hedge fund buyer. Therefore, PPC continued to be successful. But then when the hedge fund buyers go away, your PPC leads no longer are quality leads because you can't really do much with them except, I guess, just say, I'm sorry, I can't help you. I don't have a buyer for the price you're asking. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? A hundred percent. So um, back in the good old days, uh, when the money was easy, that we would have a buy price from one of our hedge fund partners before we went on an appointment. So we could kind of back into where we need to be, um, you know, in terms of buying from the seller. That what, a, what a slept on strategy though, dude. Like people don't realize how smart that is. They think they should go and get a contract on a house and then go find a buyer. You guys are doing it the right way. And some people call it reverse wholesaling. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is the way it's supposed to be done. It's not reverse wholesaling. This is what wholesaling is. You have a buyer that gives you a buy number. 
then you go to the appointment and you reverse engineer and you make your offer based on what you already know you can sell it for. Yeah, absolutely. That's how we prefer to do business. Um, the, I mean, at the time it was great. There were times when I would even bring somebody from the, um, one of our hedge fund partners with me on the appointment and bring them with me. Cause we had a really good relationship with them and say, cause you know, PPC leads, they trade very quickly. And if you bring somebody with you that, you know, they can kind of underwrite the deal and get you a buy price, like an actual buy price with the inspection included all done at the appointment, we were giving them firm offers a day later and beating people to the punch. Impressive, bro. Impressive. Okay, cool. So now we're up, we're up to speed on your marketing channel. So this this deal that we're going to talk about came from PPC. So you were spending money on Google. You were paying somebody to administer that. So you weren't the one that was actually doing it. You hired a company and your $6,000 included their administrative cost plus the actual spend on Google to get yep. it to pop up on people's internet. Um, when they're browsing or what they're doing, whatever, watching YouTube, whatever they're at, it pops up in the side or on the thing. And it says, Hey, we buy houses cash. They click on the thing. And then they're sending a message to you. You guys are then calling them, setting an appointment and going and meeting with these sellers. That's essentially the process. Yep. hundred percent. Cool. So this lead, do you remember how this lead came in? What the first thought was, what, what was the situation? What did the, why did the seller want to sell in the very beginning? Yeah. So, um, they had listed the property on the MLS a couple months before, um, they reached out to us and the property had expired. Um, <clears throat> what it ended up, ended up happening was they lived in the house for a long time. And while the house wasn't in bad condition, it wasn't, you know, turnkey for a retail buyer. Um, and they also, when they listed it, they listed it at a price, uh, at a premium to what I thought, um, fair value was for a retail buyer on the MLS. So what, what ended up happening was they originally listed it at 120. And then they walked the price down through price reductions in increments of five or 10 K until they got back down to 90 K and that's when it expired. And that's when they reached out to us. Okay. Got it. This is great. Um, really good for people to know how this all works. So they hire a real estate agent and I, you know, I'm going to tease David green on bigger pockets a lot about this. David green made a comment on bigger pockets like two months ago. And he said, I don't know why anybody thinks wholesaling is a viable model because real estate agents can get a seller a much higher pri uh, price almost every single time. And what this story is telling me is that your seller, who we're about to hear the story about, and there's some craziness that's in this story, the seller did go hire a real estate agent. And the real estate agent said, probably told the seller, hey, we can sell this house for $120,000. Otherwise, why would they list it for $120,000? Right. Need I remind people that the buyer dictates the price, not the agent, right? The market and the buyer dictate, dictates the price and the value of the property. So seller lists it for 120 with an agent and through basically desperation, they keep lowering the price over and over and over trying to reset and uh, percolate the market and get people interested. And to no avail, they could not get this um, thing sold. And so the seller fired the agent and therefore was like, I'm just going to sell this thing myself. So the seller goes online looking for somebody to buy the house, sees your ad that you paid for through PPC and then gives you got, they don't call you. They just click on the thing, set an appointment. They basically say, send an inquiry to your website and then you guys call them. Correct. Correct. Okay, cool. So it was an expired listing. The agent is now out of the picture because the agent has been fired. It is now just you and the seller communicating with each other. What was the story the seller told you on the phone? So um, <clears throat> they lived in the house for 25 or so years. Uh, it was the family home. And they moved out of, the, of the, this property that we're talking about in they bought a new house. So they have a new mortgage on the new house. And they also did a bunch of renovations to the new house. So they spent money out of pocket and they have a new house payment. And what they said to me was, we have this house. Uh, we couldn't sell it on the MLS. Um, there's really been not any interest. And we're in a position right now where we have $75,000 worth of debt um, you know, th through two mortgages on the property. And we just want to walk away and not carry two house payments, um, not carry an extra set of carry on this, on this house that we're looking at. Okay. So the bunnies in this situation is that this is a big one, right? People will ask this. I'm sure Adam, when you first ju jumped in the business, you probably asked these questions too. Like, why would the seller 
let you just take over their payments? Why would the seller sell at a discount? Why would the seller just walk away from a, a property? I'm trying to buy the property. Why would they get rid of it? Right? You ask these questions. And then when you hear the story and somebody breaks down the bunnies, you actually understand what the problem is. They went through an agent for multiple months and they already have a second house. They've moved into the second house, or at least they've been emotionally tied to the second house. Every month, they've got two payments on the house that we're talking about that they're making month in and month out while the agent cannot sell the house. So pain, pain, pain is just stacking up and stacking up, stacking up. And then on top of it, they've now run out of money. They've spent a tremendous amount of time. The market has just straight up told them your house is not worth what you want. And now they're just like, we feel like there's a ball and chain slowing us down, dragging us down. We just want to get the hell out of this thing and just not think about it ever again. So they go from, I want to sell this with an agent to, will you please just take this pain off my back? Yeah. Yeah, basically they just they wanted a, a solution where ideally they didn't have to bring any money to the table to to pay off the mortgages. Got it. And what was are, were you the one that talked to the seller the first time? Yeah. How'd that conversation go? It went really well. Um, you know, they uh, they kind of walked me through everything that was going on and um, it sounded like, you know, when when all was said and done that their interest, their 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 first concern was just to kind of walk away and um, you know, when I was analyzing kind of in my head at the time, you know, how to make this deal work, I knew it wouldn't work um, as a cash deal because we always go cash first. I knew it wouldn't, wasn't going to work at 75K to pay the mortgage balance off. So, um, you know, I, I kind of began the process of thinking, you know, my mind went immediately to creative. Um, and uh, so we, we began that conversation. So the first conversation, you knew it wasn't cash based on the conversation. Yeah. And then you... In the first conversation, you also brought up a creative solution. What was their reaction to that? So the way we pitch things is we kind of pitch um, any seller on like a suite of solutions. And our thought is like, we'll give you every option that you could ever have to sell your house. You just pick one. So we, we, we kind of gave them everything from, you know, we could, we could buy a cash. Um, and at the time, I didn't have the firm numbers in my head. I was just kind of walking them through the process, but you can buy cash. Um, you could list it with us. Uh, I'm not an agent, but my wife is. So you could list it with us. And there's some creative options that we have in between that we can talk about. And so, you know, we kind of, we furthered the conversation. Um, we were actually, I, I went on the, um, the, the buy appointment um, at the property to go check it out. And, um, you know, in the process of, you know, speaking to them, uh, building rapport. And I have to give my wife credit, uh, Hannah. She did a really, really good job of building rapport with the sellers. And um, basically, we would later find out that the way that we structured this deal, um, the, the rapport was really the key thing uh, for this because, um, as I'll explain later, it, it, the, the, the way the mechanics of the deal are, are a, fair, a little bit more complex than a standard sub two. And so the, the, the idea of them being on board with, you know, letting us take over payments and, and, and all of that um, really was you know, began at the, the rapport building segment. I love it. And why, why do you think rapport was so important in this situation? Because it was so, so unique and the sellers had never heard of a solution like this. So in order to get on board with it, they had to have a level of trust that rapport was required to build that trust? A hundred percent. So in a standard uh, sub two or seller finance situation, <clears throat> rapport is, is critical. And, um, you know, there's the standard objections of what happens if you default, you know, what happens if the due on sales clause, et cetera, is called, et cetera. Um, but in this case, um, we, we actually negotiated to have the sellers pay us to sub to the, the property. So, um, you know, in addition to the standard set of objections, um, we kind of had to have a conversation about them paying us to do the deal. That's amazing. So we're going to get into how the deal was structured, but the sellers had such a significant amount of pain mixed with Hannah's ability to build rapport in person at the appointment that the seller ended up paying you to take over their payments. That's correct. Yeah. Wow. The, 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 the way we framed it was, um, you know, you kind of, after we gathered all the information that we had, you kind of have three options. You know, you can list the property again, we can list it for you. Who knows what's going to happen if you do that? Because, you know, you didn't have any success the first time. And second of all, um, the house, it's not in terrible condition, but it's definitely not moving ready. So, you know, the FHA is not going to work. You're going to have to come to the table with, with money. And this is kind of a price point. That's a sweet spot for FHA buyers. So 
anyone else, you know, we're in a, we're in an environment where a year ago people were waiving inspections. Now people are doing inspections and they're, they're picking apart houses a lot more. So, you know, who knows what that's going to look like. Option two, I could give you 55,000 for, for the property cash, we'll pay your closing costs as is, but that doesn't really solve your problem because you're bringing 20 K plus to the closing table to pay off the loans, or we can do something creative. And, um, you know, with, with the way that this is structured as is in, in the two mortgages you have, um, it doesn't really work for us. So let's figure out a way to, to make it work. I freaking love that. So wa walk me through the numbers on the deal. Sure. So, um, <clears throat> you know, in terms of the purchase price, they were okay just having the 75K loan balance covered. They just, they didn't need to walk away with anything. They didn't want any cash at closing, anything like that. So um, numbers wise, there was a first lien piece of paper on the property um, that was uh, expiring or sorry, maturing in four and a half years. Okay. And uh, the payment was 850 P and I only, not no tax insurance. Okay. And 70 or sorry, 90% of that 850 was principal. So it was 700 principal, 150 interest. Oh, that's great. Okay. Yeah. So when I saw that, it kind of got my mind thinking like, wow, that's the great piece of paper to, to sub to because um, the principal pay down super high and um, you know, that's attractive. Um, but, you know, in addition to that, there was a second lien, um, second lien mortgage where, Payment on that was 220, and that was taken out within the last couple of years. That's also P and I, no tax and insurance. Um, okay, and this was must have been like a HELOC or something. Yeah, uh, it was like a, a consolidation loan. Uh, they had some credit problems, and it was like a super predatory, um, t and it was struck at 10 percent kind of thing. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So that's obviously not a particularly attractive uh, mortgage to sub to, but my thought was that just looking at the, the two on the same piece of paper, like when you add them together, where does that leave you? You know, if, if you got one really good one and one really bad one, if you add them together, does it make it okay? And that's kind of where I began my process. Love it. I mean, at, at the end of the day, you're looking for cash flow, right? So what does this prop, what's the potential of this property? What's the money making strategy? I'm trying to stop saying exit strategy because it confuses people. So What's the money making strategy? What's the way to fill this property with a way to make money? And then what is the potential cash flow on this property? Sure. So, um, you know, it's in a call it C, C plus neighborhood. So the idea of doing like short term, medium term, um, I didn't think that that was going to uh, work very well. Um, and the numbers wouldn't support any kind of an exit where we like flip or uh, subtailed or anything like that. So it was really going to be a long-term rental or nothing. Um, the, the other thing I would add is that, you know, in, in my business, we, for, for buy and hold properties, we underwrite everything to work as a long-term rental in case things go sideways. That's just one of the things that we do. I know a lot of other people don't, um, but for us, that, that gives us security and comfort knowing that, you know, if there's. Uh, a COVID like event where the government shuts down, or if there's, you know, um, some say, let's say we were trying to run this as a short term rental, local ordinance changes and bans it, you know, we, we have a, a, an exit strategy, a secondary exit strategy. So um, it just so happened to work as a long term rental, is the, that's really the, the only one that I thought it would work as, but we make sure that everything works that way um, before we buy it. Okay. So long term rental, meaning you're going to put a regular rental in, renter in there for like a year to two years. What do you think you could rent this property for? I'd say about $1,400. Dang. Okay. So it's not going to crush it, right? It's not going to, it's not like it's going to go out and make like a thousand dollars a month, but it sounds like you've got a gross, a gross cash flow before um, taxes and insurance. You've got about 350 bucks a month, somewhere around there that you can make. You take out your uh, taxes and insurance and you take out your management and your uh-oh money. Like, uh-oh, the window broke, uh-oh, whatever. Seems like you're probably going to walk away may maybe making 100 bucks a month. Not a not a killer cash flow. However, you'll be able to raise rents at some point in the next 24 months. So you can bump that up to probably $300 a month in cash flow and so on and so forth. Um, wh why, why were you excited about this deal? It sounds like obviously it was a free house, one, but then the seller had to pay you to take the house? 
Yeah. So um, the we were excited about it because, you know, when I was doing my underwriting, um, when you add in, you know, first lien, second lien, and then the tax insurance um, have to go in there because they weren't escrowed, um, we basically would be running it at a negative cash flow, um, which is not something that we really look to do. We're not in a position where we're buying depreciation. Um, we need our assets to cash flow something, uh, at least not be negative. But uh, the principal pay down aspect of it of $700 a month was so attractive um, to us because, you know, it may not be cash flow, but we looked at its income, you know, whether you, you call it equity or whatever you want to call it sometime down the road that, that, there's, that there's dollar value to that. So, um, you know, we were thinking, like, how do we make this work where um, even in with respect to the first lien mortgage, there's a four and a half year kind of run that it needs to kind of carry over. When that matures, that 850 a month payment goes away. So we're in a really good spot then. So how do we get from today to four and a half years from now? And the way we do that is um, we basically get a loan from the seller and have them loan us money in monthly increments. So uh, we basically calculated it's going to cost $460 a month to make us happy, to make a cash flow and to make, you know, a secured, you know, to pay all of our expenses, et cetera. And then we got that uh, principal pay down there. So 460 fit like a glove for us. And, you know, that's what we pitched. So the seller pays $460 per month? Yeah. They actually just made their first payment. We just closed uh, recently. They, they made the first payment. Wow. That is phenomenal. Thanks. $460 a month, the seller said, okay, so let's, let's be the naysayer in this situation because there's always somebody who's going to listen to this and go, why would the seller do that? Well, if, you, if at this point you're still asking the question of why did the seller do that, then you didn't pay attention to the very beginning of this. So let's throw that out, out the, of the way. But um, what happens, Adam, if the seller doesn't continue to make the $460 payment? Right now, they've got a lot of pain. But let's say in a year from now, two years from now, they wake up and they're like, what the hell are we still making this $460 payment for? This is crazy. Adam and his partners took this freaking property. They're making all this money and we're still paying 460 bucks. This sucks. Yeah, it's it's really a risk reward analysis, right? So um, basically I got comfortable with the fact that if they defaulted on day one, it wouldn't be the end of the world because we would have negative cash flow, a couple hundred bucks a month. We would have the, the principal pay down, which is awesome. And it wouldn't be the end of the world. So our nightmare scenario was palatable. Um, so I, I just got comfortable comfort with that. Um, but in terms of legally speaking, in terms of, you know, protections and things, you know, we have a promissory note and the promissory note protects us. And it spells out exactly whose responsibilities are what, who has to pay what and when, and um, you know that's how we're protected. Wow, so phenomenal, so phenomenal. Now the seller is actually paying less money per month than they were prior, right? Because they were basically paying their first lien position, which was 858, I believe, or 850. Yep. They were paying their second lien position their consolidation loan, 220. And then they were paying their taxes and insurance on top of that. So they were probably paying 12, 1300 bucks a month out of pocket. Yep. So now for them to go, we're only down to 460 a month is a major sigh of relief for them. So yep. I can see how that actually solves their problem. It doesn't create another one. It solves their problem because for the last six months, while the house was listed with an agent, they were paying 1300 bucks a month, just keeping that property vacant and hemorrhaging capital. Yeah, exactly. So <clears throat> the way we framed it was, um, you know, we, we're thinking about how does this look at, compared to their next best option? So if we were to buy it for cash and they had to come to the table with 20 grand, they're in effect crystallizing their loss. You know, yes, they get to walk away with it. Yes, there's no more uh, mortgage payment or anything like that, but they're taking the 20, they're coming to the table with 20 grand or more. And they're, they're, that's that. So what we decided to do is say, hey, why don't you just loan us the money for the four and a half years until the first loan rolls off and then we'll pay you back. Um, so basically you front us for four and a half years, kind of make the deal work for us. And then when that first lien loan uh, rolls off and we no longer have that $850 payment, we're going to have some money to pay you back. So. so essentially we'll pay the $460 monthly back to the seller for another four years. So it's basically make sure that we're covered for the next four and a half years. And we'll pay you that money back over the next four and a half years. Exactly. Wow. So creative, bro. Thank you. So I learned creative. from the best. 
well, you know, th this is the great thing about having a, a, a community of people that are all doing creative deals like this and, and why we built this community was to, to cultivate leaders like yourself. And, and dude, think about the amount of people that will listen to this inside of our community and go, oh my gosh, Adam just brought a whole different structure to the table I've never heard of before. And it, you will give other people permission to go out and do similar deals just like this, where it's like, this property doesn't cash flow. Why not have the seller cover the cash flow until I can raise rents or in, until the loan pays off or until I can refinance or until whatever? I did a deal three years ago is when we first started the community. The seller still pays me every single month. And basically what happened is the I didn't want to pay the closing costs. I took over the seller's house and I, go, I don't want to pay for, pay for the closing costs. He says, well, I'd, he goes, I don't have the money to pay for it. And I go, okay, this is what I'll do. I'll pay the closing costs and the first month's mortgage while the house is vacant. Once I get it rented out, I'm okay, but I don't want to hemorrhage that money and not be paid back for it because I'm solving your problem. And I, I set it up where he has to pay me $146.50 every single month to pay back the closing costs and the first month's mortgage. And he's been paying that now for 36 months. He has four, uh, 12 more months to go. And so when you look at things that way, that these things are possible, like Adam, I've never done a deal like that. Freaking genius. Thank you. I appreciate that. Bro, shout out to Hannah too. How, how <laughs> important was Hannah in the whole process? Uh, crucial. Um, the, the, the rapport building. So <clears throat> in general sub two deals, it's, can be challenging to uh, to convince people to to let you take over the payments with all the objections they have. When you add to that that they're going to, we're getting into a long term relationship where not only am I taking over the payments, but for some period of time you're going to be paying me, and then I'm going to be paying you back. Um, all of that I think really was won uh, at the appointment when we were sitting in the front room with them because you know, they had dogs. They were showing us pictures of the dogs, and you know, we had a great conversation. They're great, fantastic people, and they just had a problem. So, and I, I think the battle was won. You know. At, at the rapport building phase. Okay, so this is a deal. It's a true. It's a true zero out of pocket deal. The seller actually is covering the costs, and the seller will ultimately get their money back at some point. Makes sense for both sides. I love it. What was a challenge that you ran into? Did you run into challenges with closing escrow in Pennsylvania? Yeah, uh, the, the the big challenge that we we ran into was uh, after we verbally hashed out all the, the terms of this deal. Um, the, the first thing that the seller said to me was, uh, this sounds great to me. Can you send me the documents and I'm going to have my attorney review it. And whenever they bring in the, let me have the attorney review it. That's always fraught with risk. Um, you know, I've had hundreds of conversations with sellers and attorneys alike and, um, you know, just the nuanced nature of sub two and you know granted it's getting more and more popular and more and more conventional it's still kind of uh rare and not a lot of people know about it so when the attorney got the documentation um that that's really when the fun began because um there were a lot of uh objections um from the attorney and the funny part was when i was talking to the sellers i said please do me two favors hire a real estate attorney um don't hire a different kind of attorney um, just believe it or not, that happens. And then the second thing I said was, and this actually ended up being one of the best things I did throughout the process was I just took, I talked to the sellers very openly and I was like, look, please make me a promise that you and I can work together on this. I was like, attorneys are attorneys. Fantastic attorneys are great. Terrible attorneys are the worst. Um, but you know, what we're trying to do here is we gave you a contract and the responsibility of your attorney is to review the contract and see, are you protected? Are you not protected? What we've found, and, and you talk about this a lot, like failing a lot for is as a precondition of success. I've had so many failed conversations where attorneys say, this is a bad deal. This doesn't work. This is terrible. And that ends the conversation. So I said to them, like, look, what we're trying to do is have them review the contract. What we're trying to avoid is they look at the contract and say, this is a bad deal. I was like, they don't know your situation. They don't know what's going on with the house. They don't know what the house is worth. For them to say, this is a bad real estate deal, that's not an acceptable answer. For them to say, this contract is terrible and you're at risk, I can live with that. And they were really cool with it. And I'm like, yeah. And, um, you know, throughout the process, you know, of course, they didn't take my advice. They hired a criminal um a criminal attorney that uh, specialized in elder law. So not the opposite of a real estate attorney. And Somebody uh, basically has no experience in real estate whatsoever. And all they're going to look for is uh, where is the crime being committed in this deal? 
Well, it's it's funny because we got a lot of the standard objections about due on sale and about um, default, et cetera. But their biggest uh, objection was they didn't understand that a sales agreement and a promissory note are two separate documents. They mm. were their biggest thing was we need it all in one document. We can't be two. And I was like, okay, I mean, we're not. You're like, do how that. is that even possible? It's a purchase <laughs> contract for the title company to put the or the closing attorney put the deal together. Yeah. It, they're not even closely related. Yeah, they're two completely different things. That that was actually that took that one took the longest uh, to overcome. Everything What's interesting else about that, Adam, is that that person went to law school. And did you go to law school? I did not. Then how do you know more about real estate than this attorney? Um, just from experience, uh, I, I would say. I can say with 100% certainty, I have much more experience in anything creative finance related than most attorneys, um, you know, in, in my area, probably in the country, just because we've had so many conversations, we've done enough deals, like I'm very comfortable with it. And all of that I've learned really from you. So, Well, you put a lot of it to action. I mean, there's a lot of people that learn from our whole community and everything that, you know, all of our leaders teach and I teach and all that kind of stuff. We bring in attorneys and whatever else, but people, a lot of people still won't put it to action. You put it to action and then you go, okay, let me start throwing spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks in this situation. Let me throw out a solution. And what, here's, here's the thing I love about the deal. Multiple things. Uh, the thing I love the most is that Adam, when the non-cash flowing situation was interfaced with you and your wife, Hannah, you didn't sit there and go, oh, it's not a deal. I'm going to throw the lead away. You pulled a different club out of the bag and said, how can I use a different club to get to make this shot work? And yeah. it's a tricky situation. I got to shoot around the tree and I got to roll it up on the green. I got a club for that. And you threw out an opportunity, you threw out an idea to the seller and the seller's like, yeah, yeah, we would do that. And you're probably, when you threw this idea, you're like, oh damn, the seller's going to pay me for, even though you maybe even thought this wasn't going to work out. The seller saying yes, you were probably like, damn, this, this is going to work. This is going to be yeah. amazing. The, the whole time, um, you know, it was one of those things where you just have to suspend disbelief. Um, you know, I was chatting with my business partner, Rowan, about this. And I was like, hey, the only way I can make this deal work is if we get them to pay us. And he was like, well, yeah, great idea, dude. But, uh, that's, you know, they're unlikely to, to say yes. And I was like, well, you can only try, right? I freaking love that. Suspend disbelief. Then the sec here's the second thing I really love about it is that you understand upfront contracts, right? And when you first get into real estate, you will hear people complain about, oh, I talked to the agent about this and they said, no, I talked to the attorney about this and they said, no, I told this, I, I, the seller, their attorney killed the deal. I'm like, did you tell the seller that this is what's going to happen? And here's the upfront contract. Here's the expectations. The attorney is going to destroy the deal. And that's not their responsibility. It's unacceptable, as you said. It's not an appropriate answer. What your attorney should say is, hey, I think you could adjust this purchase contract and here's some highlights and some notes. And for that seller, come back to me and we can work this deal out. But coming back and saying that this deal is not a good deal is not that attorney's job. So as long as you can promise me that that's where we're gonna land after you have this conversation with the attorney, then I will encourage you to go talk to an attorney. Because you did that and you coached that seller, the seller hears the attorney say all these things and then goes, oh, Adam was told me that this was going to happen. Yeah. Which actually shows your experience and only adds more credibility to you because now the seller's like, damn, Ad Adam freaking, does he, can he see the future? Yeah, exactly. So um, that was my thought when I was, was talking to the, the seller. I was like, I got to front run the situation a little bit. And, you know, I'm lucky because I have a fantastic attorney. His name is Matt Fiscus. I'm going to give him a shout out. Uh, Fiscus and Ball. Uh, great guy. He's an absolute. Uh, he's really smart, really great to work with if you ever do deals in the greater Pittsburgh area. But, you know, um, when we were drafting all this up, um, the the seller's attorney was just coming up with, you know, objection after objection. And basically she read from my playbook, her objections were exactly what I talked to about the seller. And so I was, a I was at the time I was able to be like, well, look, see, I told you they would do that. And they were like, oh yeah, you were right. And so that just, it made the whole process a lot easier because we were able to push back and say, look, you're just flat out wrong. It needs to be two documents um, and, and to, to kind of overcome all the other objections. And it just made the whole process easier.
And Matt Fiscus helped out, I imagine, maybe via email chain or maybe even called the other attorney and helped out, right? Yeah. So um, he, it was actually funny because when I told him about this deal, he was like, how do you want me to put this into a promissory note? It's just, there's so many moving parts and we kind of had to laugh about it, but you know, what, he basically was going back and forth, you know, over email with the attorney. And then um, there were points in time where he kind of called me in and said, Hey, what do you want to do here? And so, you know, for example, like the, that they were particularly concerned about, you know, they were thinking that if, if do on sale got called, we, sorry, let me back up for a second. We put language in uh, our contracts to say that if uh, do on sale gets called, we have the right to deed it back to you and buy it on a land contract. And that was, I mean, for, for the, the seller's attorney, that was something they just couldn't wrap their head around. They didn't understand the process well enough. So they were thinking that the mortgage, the do on sale gets called, the seller's going to have to pay this off. Deeding it back doesn't help. So uh, throughout the process, our attorney was going back and forth and kind of just tagging me in where needed. Bro, that's so freaking great. Having a great attorney is one of the best things ever. And it, what's interesting is people that are also brand new in the business, they're afraid of having an attorney that you become friends with. And they don't realize that that is actually one of the most important tools you can add to your business. How important was that, that you already had an established relationship with Nick? Uh, yeah. So, you know, I have a great relationship with Matt and having, having a, a great attorney is one of the most, if not the most lethal weapons in your arsenal, because it makes situations like this. I mean, I wouldn't say easy, but easier and doable. And the fact that you are not the one negating the seller's attorney, but another attorney with credibility is fighting them and saying, Hmm, what you're saying doesn't make sense. And if the seller's copied on those email chains, the seller starts questioning their attorney by saying, oh my gosh, this freaking Adam's attorney is wiping the floor with my attorney. Yeah, and they were. We were all copied on everything. So Wow, that, that, I can't even imagine being that attorney. It's like, man, I am out of my depth right now. I'm like, I'm drowning in the deep end, you know? Yeah, but 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 the funny thing was when all was said and done, um, you know, she, generally unavailable kind of, you know, couple days here and there, no response thing. But when it came time to put the, the legal fee on the HUD, there was no problem getting a hold of them. Of course. As you would have it. Isn't that interesting, man? We yeah. could talk about that for an hour <laughs> alone. It's just like, it, these are just other human beings, right? But when you think of an attorney, you think, oh, this high level, amazing human being that's got their act together but they're just another human being trying to pay their bills. And so he's, I bet you that criminal attorney was sitting there going, I do not want to take this job. This is beyond my <laughs> understanding, but you know what? I could at least pay some bills with it. So I guess I'll do it. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure that's pretty accurate. Yeah. The attorney, I wonder if the seller hired that attorney because they were already friends with them to some degree. I think it was, I don't know the exact reason, but um, the, the sellers, one of the sellers' um, parents passed away and um, they passed down um, a, a house through, um, through an estate. And I think that, um, that their parent was old and because this attorney specialized in elder care as well. I think there was some relationship there. I didn't get the, the answer because it was kind of unimportant, but I'm pretty sure that it was a friend or somebody that they worked with before. So many nuggets, man. I mean, you could do a whole masterclass on just this one deal, right? The suspending disbelief, the rapport that your wife built, um, the expired listing, the fact that you have the seller paying you, that's super creative and amazing. All it is is solving the seller's problem, right? It's not like if I heard this 10 years ago before I understood creative finance, I'm like, that's impossible. But then you start listening to these types of stories, you're like, well, it solved the seller's problem, didn't it? And the seller is happy and grateful to pay that 460 bucks because in their mind, it's like, I'm saving $900 a month. So in the yeah. seller's mind, it's, I'm not paying 460, I'm saving 900. Yeah, they're saving 900 and then we're going to pay them back um, with a little bit of interest. So, so, so smart. Possible. Shout out to Mask, Matt Fiscus. Shout out to Hannah. Shout out to you, Adam. This was freaking unbelievable, bro. Appreciate it.